Hey y'all, welcome to Sandy's Library. My name is Sandy and today I'm going to wrap up uh, my book, If I Had Married You. And just as a quick reminder, uh, this is not a professional production. It's just an author reading her book. So let's get started. Part four, where did the time go? Chapter 23. I know that some people would look at our relationship like I had taken a back seat to the army, but I never did. I am confident when I say that you have always loved me beyond measure. So I was determined that I wasn't going to be like the other wives and view the army as my husband's mistress. Honestly though, looking back now, I think it might have been closer to the truth to say it was actually the other way around. And let's face it, the army was your first priority. It had to be. It was what you signed up for, and I knew that when I married you. But you gave me things that the army could never hope to share with you. She could never receive those longing, carnal looks from you that were reserved solely for me. She could never give you a child. She could never feel your intoxicating touch or give you one. And she could never love you back, not like me. I've always known that if you were forced to make a choice, your decision would lean toward whoever wasn't doing the forcing. So, I made it a point to never be the forcer. Oddly enough, though, I was okay with it. I figured, hell, if soldiering made you happy, then I was willing to do whatever I could to support that, just to be with you. And yes, there were times when I had cause to worry about you, but I guess it helped that I'm a firm believer in predestination. I was just along for the ride, and what a ride it's been. After all these years and four grown children, the Army and I are still sharing you, and I'm okay with that. And I've gotten kind of used to it, in fact. I'll admit that I have some fleeting thoughts of you saying goodbye to the Army, but it's not something that I'm hanging on to. You enjoy being a soldier, and I can't bring myself to even ask you to give it up. And the army liked you too. She'd been good to us. You had indeed been on the fast track. And it was a warm late summer day about mid-morning when you came into the house through the garage door. Hey, Colonel, I said, going to your side where you brushed your lips against my cheek. You're a little early for lunch, I said. What gives? I have news, you said. And for the first time, I couldn't tell how you felt about it. Not really. Usually, if it had something to do with promotions, you were filled with beaming smiles that practically reached from ear to ear. And while your smile was there, it held a measure of reservation. So I had to wonder. It's not like the other wives and I hadn't talked about what we do if and when our guys left the army. The 30-year mark seemed to be the golden ticket for most. At least they thought that, after 30 years, their spouses would be ready to retire. I wasn't so sure. This didn't feel like the where would you like to retire to talk. <clears throat> I asked, so where are we going? And I'm proud to say I said it without the least bit of bitterness. I had, after all, let myself entertain the notion of you retiring but only for a split second. So I smiled to let you know I was still on Team Us. It took a few seconds for you to say Washington, D.C., if we want it. Washington, D.C., I asked. That truly confused me. Only suits went to D.C., so I asked. What brigade are you taking command of there? You shook your head. It's a desk job. It's mine if I want it. I asked. If you want it, this choice thing seemed foreign to me. It means a star, you said. I can take it or leave it. I didn't hear anything past the word star. <clears throat> a star, I asked? Like a one-star general? 
I was in awe. <clears throat> I know you're missing the kids, you said. And I know that deep down inside, you want a home for them all to come to. You reached for my hands and held on to them gingerly. So, if you're okay with this promotion, I swear I'll make it up to you. Well, you know, I slid my hand across the counter. I've always wanted to sleep with a general. I shot you an enticing look and smiled. You wrapped me in your embrace, a place I love dearly, and gazed down at me, as if you hadn't been doing that same thing for the last 30 years. You asked, how did I get so lucky? I hugged you tightly. Suddenly thought the thought that I'd be a general's wife scared the hell out of me. I did the math. <clears throat> the kids would be scattered all over the country. We rarely get to see them, and on top of all that, I'd be scrutinized to hell and back, and probably on a daily basis. But no matter wherever you went, I'd follow, and I knew I'd be missing our children the whole time. Two days after your big news, that evening, Junior and Emily called after you'd come home from work. I answered the phone. Hi, Mom, I heard Junior say. I said to him, it's wonderful to hear your voice. I mouthed the words, it's Junior, to you. He asked, is Dad home? I need to talk to both of you. Anxiety twisted and nodded in my gut. If something was wrong, how were we supposed to help our son when we were so far away? But I was a seasoned veteran at this. I said calmly, yeah, he got home a little while ago. I put the call on speaker and said to you, he wants to talk to both of us. Evening, son, you said, then asked, how's Texas? Wonderful, Junior said, and I thought I detected a measure of bliss in his tone. He added, Emelyn, I have news. I started to get a sinking feeling in my gut. I said cautiously, well, don't keep us in suspense. Junior and Emily chimed in unison. We're pregnant. There was a flurry of chaotic conversation after that. Emily was due in May, and it was still too early to tell the sex of the baby. After we ended the call, you pulled the bottle of Dalmore the kids had given us for our 30th anniversary this year and poured yourself a dram and a half for me, knowing I wouldn't drink all of it. You gestured me to the couch while you carried our drinks. I sat down, and then you handed me a glass as you sat down beside me. You took a healthy swallow, then watched me as I sipped mine. I set my glass on the coffee table, glanced at you, and managed a feeble smile. Darling, we're going to be grandparents, you said, and then shook your head. You don't seem very excited. I felt the sad smile spreading across my face, so I looked away, saying, Oh, I'm incredibly excited about this next chapter of our lives. I gathered up enough courage to drive my gaze back to yours. This was the first time I'd ever entertained the notion of telling you exactly what I thought about the situations the Army had put us in over the years. But you know, the words came pouring out of my mouth. I guess I always thought I'd be present in our grandchildren's lives. Or at least, now that we knew we were going to have one, I knew I wanted to be. You will be, sweetheart, you said surely. When Emily has the baby, you can go out beforehand, just like your mom and mine did with us, he said with a hope-filled tone. And you can go see them whenever you want. I could only manage a half-strength nod just before I said, I know, baby, and I am happy. I glanced up at you. I really am. I touched your cheek and held my hand there for a moment before continuing. We're going to be in Washington. Junior and Emily and the new baby will be in Texas. The girls are in Florida, and Jason's currently in Georgia. I said with a shrug, then asked, but where will he be in five years, in ten? He was in the army, after all. I shook my head as if a happy ending was futile. I just don't see how any of our grandchildren will ever live in the same place. Will they even know each other? I mean, really know each other? Or will they 
simply be those long distance relatives that know about each other's existence but rarely come face to face. <clears throat> I was nearing tears now. We don't even have a place for our children to call home. He closed the gap on the few inches that separated us on the couch and touched my cheek. You asked for nothing but sincerity. You don't want me to take the star. I want you to do whatever it is that makes you happy, I said. Surely, because, in the end, I wouldn't trade the life I've had with you for a more rooted one if it meant I wouldn't have been with you. Over the next couple of days, I began to mentally prepare myself for the inevitable move to Washington, and I couldn't get the fact that I was going to be a grandmother in May out of my head. I came in through the garage door at 11.30, the typical lunchtime when you are on post. I'd fix sandwiches and macaroni salad. <clears throat> I took both out of the refrigerator and put them on the table along with a pitcher of iced tea. I'd already laid out our plates and silverware. As we sat down at our usual spots at the table, he slid a folded piece of paper toward me. I didn't know what to think about your attention flowing toward the sandwiches and salad where you began loading the plate, what was on the paper. I reached for it and began my inspection by unfolding it. You filled our glasses with iced tea while I looked at it. What turned out to be a real estate flyer. It had a picture of a sprawling Victorian style house on it that reminded me of back home. I sighed. What's this? I asked, waving the paper at you. It's a house in Willow Falls, you said, of my hometown. The place where my parents, my aunts and uncles and cousins, including Samantha, all live. But I thought maybe we should buy it, you said casually. It's only a couple of blocks from Junior and Emily's house. Why? I asked, unable to see the point. What good did it do to have a house in Willow Falls if we could only get to it for brief visits a couple of times a year? So our kids have some place to call home, you grinned at me. So you have some place to gather all the grandchildren we're going to have. There was joy and laughter in your eyes as you caressed my cheek. You can have the grandkids over every weekend if you want. It has five bedrooms. There's plenty of room for you to spoil them all. I sighed longingly. It sounded heavenly, except for one thing. But you won't be there, I said helplessly. You'll be in Washington. <clears throat> you stood up and pulled me into your arms, saying, No, I won't. I've done a lot of thinking since Junior's phone call. You paused long enough for me to notice the despair in your tone. I'm leaving the Army. I tried to contain my glee over the prospect as I asked, what about your promotion? It wasn't like promotions to general were handed out to just anybody. Those were basically appointed by the Senate. You said without the least bit of doubt, darling, I enjoy being a soldier. But you know what I figured out? I shook my head and shrugged. <clears throat> you looked deep into my eyes when you said, you have given so much of yourself to my wants and needs. Now it's my turn. Are you sure about this? I asked. I had to give you one last opportunity to change your mind. I want to make you as happy as you've made me. I said, baby, I've never been unhappy in our marriage. You know that. I know. You smiled softly at me. I regret not being there when Junior and Jason were born, you shrugged off your emotions. But I plan on being there for all the births of our grandchildren, you chuckled and squeezed my hand. They'll find me sitting out in the waiting room, holding my sweetheart's hand as we wait for each one's arrival. <clears throat> I caressed your face and gazed into your eyes. How did I get so lucky? I'm the lucky one, you said softly and turned a wicked grin on me. Look out, Texas, here we come. He laughed and added, right back where we started from. I thought about that first day when we met and how we'd gone out that night and ended up singing 
karaoke together. Remember? You sang Jackson with me. The fire we set that night will never go out. Epilogue. Sometimes fate is cruel to lovers. Sometimes you get nothing more than a simple glimpse of what it's like to be with your soulmate. Sometimes circumstance forces you to walk away. So you close off your heart and start the long, arduous task of learning how to go on. You even get married and have children. And that's when it happens. You learn to love again. You busy yourself with your new family so you have no time to think about the cruel twist of fate that's been played upon you. You have found a way to go on. And just as my grandmother had warned many years later, you wake up one day and realize that life has passed you by. Now, I truly understand what she meant when she said there was nothing sadder than an old woman prompting a ghost from her past. But what do you do when you find yourself in that position? What do you do when you wake up one day to find out that your heart is wide awake and aching for what could have been. Someone once said, you can't help who you love. True words were never spoken. I know this to be true because I have loved you since the first time I looked into your eyes and I love you now, still, after all this time. Sometimes I think about looking you up, but I can never quite bring myself to actually do it. I fear what I might find. After all, I've managed to find someone to love again, and we have children together. I have no delusions about you not having done the same thing. I know the odds are in favor of it. You'd be far too much of a catch. And there's always the chance that you're... I can't even say it. I can't talk about you no longer being on this earth. So I have to believe that you're still alive and well. Truth be told, I'm a little bit afraid of what might happen if we did get back in touch. I fear the temptation of you would be far too much. You see, I've made a vow to another and I intend to keep my vow. But there is a place where I can go that I don't belong to him. A place where I still belong to you. A place where you and I have a family. It exists inside my dreams, and I can't wait to go to sleep every night just so I can go home. I hope that someone out there manages to find some pleasure in listening to me read my book, If I Had Married You. It's the last one I ever wrote, and I can't begin to tell you how special it is to me and I'm happy to share it with the world. While I was writing this story, I had a vague idea that the hero wanted to tell his own story and under the title, Dream a Little Dream of Me. But alas, my cognitive issues kept that idea from coming to fruition. I think that maybe why I had that period where all I did was read tarot cards for twin flames and separation because the hero in my head had to get his story out there and my left brain issues wouldn't let me tell it. So I guess the tarot readings became my creative outlet because they allowed the hero in my head to get his story out there too. He didn't come through in all of the readings, but he does filter in in most of them. More often than not, he was there in the background of my mind, putting in his two cents worth. And now that he's done that, I just don't read the cards anymore. But what I am going to do is share my books with y'all. I have 19 professionally produced audio books, which I plan to share with y'all as soon as Sandy's crew can compile the files, and they are being actively worked on. As for my books that haven't been professionally narrated, just like this one, I plan to read them for y'all. 
And at some point, I may well read a few of the professionally produced ones on camera as well. So stay tuned. Later, Gators. This has been If I Had Married You, written and read by Sandra Edwards, copyright 2018 by Sandra Edwards, production copyright 2020 by Sandra Edwards.